I want to talk a little bit today about uh, the budget for Louisiana state government from 30,000 feet. And I want to put it in perspective first. In, uh, in 2004, actually fiscal, let's call it fiscal year 2005, I picked that year because it was the, uh, the last budget other really than the current budget that Louisiana didn't have any one-time federal funds to help us rebuild after the storms. In fiscal year 2005, the budget for our state was $16.5 billion. The general fund was about $6.5 billion. Today, 10 years later, our budget is $25 billion. And I'm talking about this year and in all probability next year. Uh, that's about uh, $8.5 billion for the general fund, but that's not all the state money in the budget. We've got about $4.35 billion in statutory dedications, monies that are dedicated. We also have about $2.5 billion in self-generated fees. Some folks think that most of our budget is comprised of federal money. That's not accurate. This year and next year, we'll receive about $10 billion of federal money out of a $25 billion budget. That's about 40%. My point, though, is that over the last 10-year period, we've gone from a $16.5 billion budget to a $25 billion budget, excluding all the hurricane money, which you have to do because it, it skews the numbers. That's a 52% increase over a 10-year period. Um, that's a 52% increase over a period of time when we haven't added people. Actually, we've lost a congressional seat. And inflation has been well under 2%. Current inflation rates are well under one and a half, some think under 1%. The truth of the matter is that putting aside the one-time hurricane money for which the state of Louisiana was just a conduit, we have more money today at $25 billion adjusted for population and adjusted for inflation than we have ever had since Louisiana became a state in 1812. And that's just a fact. So how come we're broke? I mean, how, how, come, how come we have a 1.6 bill, well, it's actually with the, with the newly discovered shortage in health care, $1.8 billion budget deficit, one billion of which is structural. How come policymakers have had to spend all $800 million in the Medicaid trust fund for the elderly? We started a few years ago with $800 million in that trust fund. We've now got zero. Um, how come uh, policymakers have had to take $400 million from the savings account we had set aside to pay retirees' health insurance claims? How come policymakers have decided to have a tax amnesty program just about every Thursday? How come policymakers have had to sell assets every year, take that non-recurring money, and use it not to pay down debt, but to pay debt service? They're about to do it again for next year, which just, is the, just pushes the problem down the road. How come if we've gone from a $16.5 billion budget in 2005 to a $25 billion budget today. How come in, in 2008, when the current administration took office, we had a $900 million surplus, and today we've got a $1.8 billion deficit? How come? Well, I want to give you one person's point of view about why we have that problem here today. And uh, the short answer is simply this. It's how we're spending the money that we do have. I don't think any reasonable person looking at the numbers can argue that we don't have enough money. We, yes, we've had more money before. At one time, our budget got as high as $28 billion. 
But we were a conduit for federal monies which flowed through state government to help our people rebuild. It's not fair to, to, to count that one-time federal money. If you take out the hurricane money and compare apples to apples, let me say it again, we've got more money today than we've ever had. I think our problem, in my judgment, is how we're spending the money. Uh, and the problem for the last seven years has been We've spent more money than we took in every single year. The budget has been balanced on paper, but it hasn't been truly balanced. Now, why is that? Let me drill down a little bit further and, and give you one person's point of view of why our spending practices need to be, need, need to be reformed. Here to me, I think, is the problem. It's twofold. We spend entirely too much money on undeserving people at the top who get bailouts and special treatment. And we spent, enti we spent entirely too much money on too many undeserving people at the bottom who get handouts. When I say undeserving, I don't mean these are bad people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying undeserving not in the pejorative sense, but in the sense that the money we're spending on the people at the top giving bailouts and the people at the bottom getting handouts would be better spent for them, for them and for the greater good on other areas. Let me give you some examples. Let's start uh, with statutory dedications. We've got, uh, this year we budgeted four point three five billion dollars in statutory dedications. That's money that doesn't have to compete with higher education or health care or anybody else. They just get their money automatically. We've got around 370 special funds set up in the state treasury by the legislature. Set up with a majority vote, by the way. They can be unset up with the majority vote. And I'm not, I'm not, there's a myth uh, that, that, that most of our money is dedicated in the Constitution. That's not true. That's not accurate. Some of it is. We have a Louisiana Educational Quality Trust Fund. Money's dedicated there. We have a tobacco, tobacco settlement trust fund called the Millennium Fund. Some of that money is dedicated. But the vast majority of our money, $4.35 billion, is dedicated by statute. And, uh, and when you look at some of the funds, to which we have dedicated money. I mean, I'll just, I'll, here's the list. Um, I, I'll just read you a couple. Um, the Audubon Golf Trail Development Fund, the Louisiana Economic Development Fund, the Entertainment Promotion and Marketing Fund, another marketing fund, <clears throat> the beaut Beautification Project for New Orleans Neighborhoods, the Vital Records Conversion Fund, the Insurance Fraud Investigation Fund, the Louisiana Auto Theft and Insurance Fraud Prevention Fund, um, let's see, the, uh, the Right to Know Fund, the uh, Fraud Detection Fund, the Cameron Parish Tourism Development Fund, the Town of Homer Economic Development Fund, the DeSoto Parish Visitor Enterprise Fund. I'm not going to read all of them, but those are illustrative. I'm not saying that all of this money should be undedicated. I'm not saying that. Some of these, these dedications are, 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 are dedications of self-generated revenue. A good example is the Bow Weevil Ratification Fund. Our farmers have gotten together, they tax themselves, they give the money to the state in return for a service. I wouldn't undedicate those funds. But not all those funds are like that. And it seems to me that if we're trying to figure out a way how to deliver, to deliver vital services to the people of Louisiana, we have to start with looking at this $4.35 billion worth of statutory dedications. And what we need to do, what the legislature needs to do, it's going to require a little work. But it has the staff through the Legislative Auditor's Office, and it has the staff through the Legislative Fiscal Office to go through each one of those dedications one by one and measure the cost versus the benefit. Why have we made the dedication? 
Is it a vital product or service that the people of Louisiana need and deserve? Should that, that particular purpose have to compete with roads and universities and health care for the money? I mean, we talk all day long about the general fund, and it's important. But the truth of the matter is that the statutory dedications are half as big as the general fund. And they're sitting there fully dedicated. We're not going to get control of the spending problem in Louisiana until we face uh, some of our dedications. Um, let, me, let me give you a, another example. <clears throat> staffing. There, there's been a lot of discussion about the number of state employees, and we have reduced our state employees. I remember I stood here about six years ago and said we can reduce, we're number one in the South in the number of state and local employees per 10,000 people. We, we need to reduce that number by not filling vacancies. Paul Rainwater, my good friend, was commissioner then, was sent out, sent out to explain that if we, we, we do that, we'll have to shut down the prisons and unplug the dialysis machines and all this stuff. Well, they did it. And we have reduced the number of state employees substantially. We didn't have to close any prisons and, uh, and, and uh, unplug the dialysis machines. And I, and I want to give Governor General credit for that. But one thing he has not looked at is our staffing levels. The legislative auditor did a report a few years ago, found that 22% of all the managers in uh, the classified service manage one employee. He found that the average span of control, the average manager in the classified service uh, manages four employees. You would never see businesses in the real world staff at those levels. Uh, what we need to do is do what uh, was recommended in 1995. Some of you remember it. Some of you remember the SELECT report. SELECT stood for Select Council on Revenues and Expenditures in Louisiana's Future. The people on that SELECT committee back in 1995 were folks like John Alario, uh, Mark Drennan, uh, Lee Griffin, these were some of the smartest people in state government who got together and one of their recommendations was to move to a span of control of one employee, or, or rather one manager for 10 employees. The select group said uh, we need to reduce all the layers of management in, e in, the, in the departments of government to no more than five. We ought to limit clerical personnel to 15% of the workforce. That's especially true today with technology. We've done none of that, folks. And the fact of the matter is that the numbers demonstrate we've got way, way, way too many generals and not nearly enough foot soldiers. We're not going to be able to right-size this budget until we address that expenditure because labor is always the largest cost for any institution. I want to give you a, a, a couple more examples. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not going to belabor this one because I've talked to you about it before. Contracts. The legislative auditor, I didn't know he was going to do it, but, but Monday a week ago he issued a report on consulting contracts. He found that we have 14,000 consulting contracts. He also found that we have 4,600 consulting contracts worth $250 million that are off the books. If you go over to the Office of Contractual Review and say, let me see the contracts, they're not going to show you 4,600 of them. You can't manage what you can't measure. You've heard me talk about these contracts before. We've got two bills in the legislature to try to address that problem. House Bill 30 by Representative Richard. House Bill 376 by Lance Harris. We've got consulting contracts. I kid you not, I'll show you later the, the numbers and the actual contract. We've got consulting contracts with the University of Tennessee, the University of Georgia, Texas Tech University, Texas A&M University, University of Arkansas, Rutgers State University, Oregon State University, uh, 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 Vanderbilt University, Duke University, University of Southern Mississippi at a time when our universities are being fiscally waterboarded. There's something wrong with this picture. Now, the administration came in front of our committee when we were hearing House Bill 30 the other day and said we, all, said we only have about 150. 
Let me read you from the fiscal note from last year's equivalent of House Bill 30. This is from the Legislative Fiscal Office. In the fiscal year 2013 alone, just one year, the Office of Contractor Review Annual Report states that OCR approved a total of 2,001 professional, personal, and consulting services contracts with a total contract value of approximately $3.1 billion. That's just one year. If you check this budget, you will find that next year we're going to spend $47 million alone on consultants for, for coastal restoration. I am all for uh, coastal restoration. But these consultants are not going to plant a blade of swamp grass. They're just going to study a problem that we know we already have. That $47 million, check my numbers if you don't believe me, that $47 million that we will spend on those out-of-state consultants to tell us we have a problem is more money than the entire general fund contribution next year to LSU and Shreveport, to Southern University and Shreveport, to McNeese State University, and to Nichols State University put together. Where are our priorities? Let me, let me mention uh, two other areas. Let me talk about Medicaid. We have a law in America, and it's more than a law, it's a moral principle, it's a good one. It says that if, if we as Americans believe that if, you, if our neighbors are too poor to be sick, we don't let them die. Some countries do. You can't afford a doctor in some countries, too bad. We don't do it that way. That separates us from a lot of societies, and I am very, very proud of that. But that comes with a cost, a big cost. We are spending $8.3 billion a year on our Medicaid program. We've got uh, 1.4 million people on Medicaid. Now that's not all. The, the Medicaid program also covers folks who don't qualify for Medicaid. We pay for them through the disproportional share program. If you add them, it's about $2 billion. And it's about 2 million people. I'm, I'm sorry, it's about 2 million people and, and probably uh, even more billion dollars. But I just want to talk about Medicaid recipients. 1.4 million people on Medicaid, we spent $8.3 billion. In January 1, on January 1 of 2008, when the administration took office, we had 1.2 million people on Medicaid, and we were spending $5.9 billion. That's a 41% increase, and we cannot sustain it. We can't. We're spending 40% of our budget on Medicaid. If you count the overhead at, at, uh, at DHH, it's about $9 billion. And we can't sustain it. And what does that mean? At some point, if it becomes 50% of our budget, or 60%, or 70%, the taxpayers who support that program are going to say, no mas. We're not going to support it anymore. The sanctity of the program will be undermined, and that rule that we're all so proud of, that it, if you're too poor to be sick, it doesn't matter in America. We're not going to let you die. It is, it is going to be undermined as well. What do we do about it? Last year, according to the Public Affairs Research Council, we had 900,000 visits to emergency rooms for routine care. Now, what does that mean? That means that our program, perfectly legal, pays for people to take a $700 ambulance ride Strike that. Medicaid pays for tax, or, or, or Medicaid taxpayers pay for people to take a $700 ambulance ride to an emergency room to be treated for acne, to get a pregnancy test, to get obesity counseling, to have their eyes examined for glasses, uh, for, for, to, for diaper rash, for infertility, to discuss infertility treatment. We will pay for those things under Medicaid, perfectly legal. 
Some might argue otherwise, but under the law, it's perfectly appropriate. But not in an emergency room. It costs five times more to treat a patient, to give a patient a pregnancy test in an ER than it does in a private clinic. It's killing us. And you know what we're doing about it at the Department of Health and Hospitals? Nothing. Zero. Nada. It's why our Medicaid spending, one of the reasons, is up 41% under this administration. Other states are doing something about it. Go over to Houston's Memorial uh, uh, Herman Hospital. They've got what's called a patient navigator program there. They establish para paraprofessionals at the entrance to every emergency room. When somebody shows up and wants to get a pregnancy test, they're told, look, we'll get you that pregnancy test. We'll get you an appointment. But you can't come here to the ER. This is for really, really, really sick people. And the law does not require it. That's another myth. The law, federal, neither federal nor state law says that if you have to treat somebody in an ER for an obvious non-emergency if they're not willing to pay for it. Um, New Mexico put in a program in 2006 called the uh, uh, Nurse Advice. It's basically a call center to nurses 24 hours a day. Uh, something like 70% of the people of New Mexico, has, New Mexico has about 2 million people, are registered. Um, you, you get sick in the middle of the night, or you, your acne flares up, or, or you want advice about a, a, removing a, a growth on, your, on, on your, uh, your, your arm, or you want to talk to somebody about how to lose weight, you don't have to go to an emergency room. You just call the nurse hotline. They'll get you an appointment with a private clinic. We can save tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars by doing what other states are already doing. We're doing nothing. I'll mention one other thing under Medicaid, and then I'll talk about tax reform. <coughs> I'm sorry. If you read the Medicaid annual report, I encourage you to do it. They put it out every year using your money. Uh, and I don't think anybody ever reads it, but I do. One statistic will jump out at you. 3%, 3% of all the, the, the people on Medicaid, 3% of that 1.4 million people on Medicaid spend 43% of the money. That means that, that 72,000 people, I'm sorry, 42,000 people are spending 3.6 billion of the 8.3 billion that we have budgeted. That's $82,000 a person. Now I know what you would do, thank you, thank you ma'am. I know what you would do if you were managing the Medicaid program. You'd go find out who those 3% are. Maybe some of it's fraud. I suspect some of it is. I suspect a lot of it are people who have chronic illnesses. They have kidney disease. They have heart disease. They have diabetes. They get sick. A lot of them don't have a primary care physician. They go right to an emergency room. Other states are doing something about it. Stanford University has, has developed an extraordinary chronic disease management program. The state of Florida has adopted it. They're saving tens and tens and tens millions of dollars. They assign a paraprofessional, usually a nurse practitioner, to these 3% chronic users of Medicaid. And the paraprofessional, the nurse practitioner, calls them up and says, Go, let me introduce myself. Here's my cell phone number. I'm going to call you in the morning, make sure you took your medication before you go to the ER. Call me. If you need an appointment with a doctor, let me know. I'll get it for you. I'll even come get you. We're going to manage your care. They're, uh, they're doing the same thing uh, at New York's uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. They have uh, 27 social workers on staff who do nothing but manage the chronically ill. Why are they doing it? Because under the Affordable Care Act, if you can keep people out of the hospital, the hospital gets extra money. You know what we're doing? Nothing. Zero. Nada. Let me, let me mention the last area uh, that I want to talk about, about how we spend our money. Getting bailouts and special treatment, and we've got too many undeserving people at the bottom getting handouts. And the middle class is getting the bill. So let's talk about tax reform. I'd rather talk about tax fairness. I don't know what tax reform means anymore. 
So let me talk about tax fairness. I used to collect taxes for the state under Mike Foster. I worked at the Department of Revenue. I was asked all the time, what, what's the best tax? Well, most states rely on property, sales, income, and now gambling taxes, or some combination thereof. And really, it's a matter of picking your poison. Every tax has advantages and disadvantages. I used to tell taxpayers, you don't want to know what the best tax is? Pick one or all four of them. But make sure that when you do it, you have as broad a base as you possibly can so everybody pays their fair share. And if you have a broad base, you can lower the rate so everybody pays less. We've got, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the tax exemption budget, um, we have 462 special rules, exemptions, to our tax code. About $7.7 .7 billion. And what those rules mean, those 462 exemptions, all exemption is, it's a rule that says <clears throat> somebody or a particular industry or a particular entity doesn't have to pay the sale, same property, sales, income, excise taxes that the rest of us pay. Because taxes not only raise money, but the other purpose of a tax system is to influence behavior. You, you want to encourage somebody to do something? Lower the taxes on them. You want to stop somebody from doing something? Raise the taxes on them. You can influence behavior. The purpose of most of these exemptions was, when they were initially established, to create jobs. But the problem with most, most of them is that we haven't looked at them in ages. I mean, the last time we looked at them, really, to weigh the cost and benefit was never. What we need to do is go through every single one of those exemptions, not with a political lens, but with the help of the legislative fiscal office, with the help of the legislative auditor, and do a cost-benefit analysis. Why did we create this exemption? Is it working? Is it creating jobs? If it is, double down. Some of these exemptions, we're going to go, man, this is awesome. They're, they're, they're stimulating the economy. But let's give them a, a bigger break. But the others that aren't working, we've got to ask ourselves, you know, is this an appropriate expenditure of taxpayer money? And the goal ought to be to be able to broaden your base to lower your rate. If this is done right, it's not done to raise revenue. If you broaden that base, you can lower your rate and your system as a whole will be better off and you'll actually collect more money. I, you know, we've got another, another week or so of the legislative session. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I, I, I've, been, I've been pleased in the sense that the legislature in this session has finally decided to stop waterboarding higher education. I think they're going to fully fund it, and that's a good thing. But I will tell you my disappointment in this legislative session has been that all you have heard is money. And by, let me put it another way. All you've heard is give me more of your money. Taxes, taxes, taxes. Nobody's talking about the spending side. Nobody's talking about the statutory dedications. Nobody's talking about how we can save money in Medicaid. Nobody is talking about how we can save money through our contracts. Now, it's okay to talk about the tax code. I would have preferred that we do it after the taxpayers have a little confidence in us where we talk about making our spending a little more efficient. But the way to make tax law, tax policy, is not to see what votes you can get for a particular measure. That shouldn't be the way you make your tax policy. You ought to systematically, rationally go through each one of these exemptions one by one by one. It shouldn't be a process of throwing them all against the wall and let's see which one stick can get, can get enough votes. Because mark my words, out of all these tax changes, we'll end up having to go back and redo about half of them. Maybe all of them if a court rules that uh, they require a two-thirds vote, which we can talk about later. That's my point of view. I don't think we have a money problem. And I don't think the money, the, the uh, let me amend that. I don't think we have a revenue problem. I think if you look at the numbers, it's clear we don't. 
What we've got is a spending problem. It is a spending problem. It's how we're spending the money that we do have. And I don't care how high you raise revenue. As long as you persist in spending more than you take in, which is what we have done each year for the past seven years, and as long as you persist in spending it, more of it on things that you just want as opposed to things that you need, you're not going to solve this budget crisis. Thanks for having me. We've got some time, so I'll answer questions. We don't have a revenue problem. We've got a spending problem. We've got a $25 billion budget. Ten years ago, the budget was $16.5 billion. You know, unless you're an Alabama graduate, the direction's up. You know, you can see that. We've got 50% more money today, 52% to be exact, than we had 10 years ago. Uh, sometimes it's not how much you have, it's how you spend what you do have. And our problem with our $25 billion budget, which adjusted for population and inflation, is more money than the states have ever had since we became a state in 1812. Our problem is our spending. And more specifically, we're spending way too much money on people, undeserving people at the top who are getting bailouts and special treatment. And we're spending way too much money on undeserving people, not everybody, but some undeserving people at the bottom who are getting handouts. And the people in the middle get the bill. And the, the, the legislature's answer to solving all that is not to concentrate on the spending side, but to just, just bring in more revenue. I don't care how much new revenue they bring in um, and how much they raise taxes. Uh, un, as, as long as they persist in spending more than they take in, they're going to run a deficit. And that's just a fact. There, there are only two rules to budgeting. Number one, don't spend more than you take in. Number two, when you do spend money, spend it on things you need, not things you just want. And we've broken every one of those rules for the past seven years. Now, we've got some bills up to help that. Uh, House Bill 30 by Representative Richard uh, would crack down on some of the 19,000 consulting contracts that the state has. Uh, those contracts would have to go in front of the Joint Legislative Committee under the budget, on the budget under our bill, and, and they could uh, eliminate some of them and save some money. We've got another bill, uh, House Bill 376 by Representative Lance Harris that would require some of this federal money that we're getting, that we're spending on out-of-state consultants and on politically connected groups, uh, that would require the, this grant money to be administered by our universities. I mean, we've got consulting contracts with, uh, with Duke, with Texas Tech, with the University of Arkansas, with the University of Georgia. Great schools, but our schools are pretty good too. That, that money ought to be administered by LSU or Southern or, or Bossier Paris Community College or Louisiana Tech. So there's some things we can do, and I, I just continue to believe our, our problem is on the spending side, not the revenue side. What about the Medicaid uh, program? Well, we're spending uh, $8.3 billion on Medicaid. When this administration took, to, took office, we were spending uh, $5.9 billion, 42%, and a lot of that money is wasted. Uh, we have 900,000 visits to emergency rooms that taxpayers pay for every year for, for non-emergencies. People taking an expensive ambulance ride to go to an ER to be treated for acne or to get a pregnancy test or to see if they need glasses. Under Medicaid, we will treat those folks for free, but not in an ER. It costs 10 times more to administer a pregnancy test in an ER than it does to a private clinic. Other states are doing something about that and saying, no, you can't go to an ER. Uh, but because you have a sunburn. Uh, uh, you know what we're doing about it? Nothing. Zero. Nada. If you look at, drill down and look at the numbers, you also find that 3% of all of our Medicaid patients spend 43% of the money. That 3% that, that is spending an average of $82,000 a year. Something's wrong. I know what I'd do and you'd do if you were running the Medicaid program. You'd find out who those 3% are and, and, and see what the problem is. You know what we're doing about it? Nothing. Zero, not all. all the DHH does is go to the legislature and say, gimme, 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 need more, need more, need more. We can save a lot of money in our Medicaid program just by copying what other states are doing. But instead, the, the response to our problem seems to be, um, we, we, don't want, we don't want to do the hard work of spending discipline. We just want you to give us, taxpayers, we just want you to give us more of your money. And I don't think that's going to solve this problem, nor do I think it's right. What about uh, tax reform? Look, I think I believe in tax fairness. Uh, we've got uh, 460 exemptions to our tax code. We ought to go through every single one of them, every single one of them, and and look at 
at the cost of each exemption and the benefits. Some of them are working. Some of them are creating jobs. If, they, if they're working, shoot, double down. Double the credit if it's creating jobs. Some of them aren't working. And the ones that aren't working, we ought to talk about getting rid of them. Uh, but that's a, it, it needs to be a systematic, rational process. Go through each one, one by one by one. Not necessarily with a goal of raising taxes, with a goal of broadening your base so you can lower the tax rate for everybody. That's the right way to make tax policy. That's not what we've been doing at the Capitol. The Capitol has just been throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks, see what can get a majority vote so they can get more money in here. And, and I understand they're under pressure, but you know what? Nobody put a gun to their heads and made them do what Bobby Jindal told them to do for the last seven years. This took us seven years to get to this problem. And the car's in the ditch. We can get it out, but we're not going to get, out, get it out by doing the same thing we did in the past. If people have questions like more information about some of the issues that you've discussed here today, what should they do? Just go to our website. We've got everything on our website, latreasury.com, L-A. T R E A S U R Y dot com. Uh, that's the Treasury website. And while you're there, check for unclaimed property.